All right, here we are. Um, uh, Pete McCall again, Exercise Science 281 at Mesa. Uh, this lecture should be a little bit quicker. This is part two. Uh, looking at the cardiorespiratory system. Going to kind of do a quick overview of the systems that support exercise, um, specifically cardiorespiratory metabolism. Um, we're going to get the digestive system. Basically, the main thing the digestive system does is it breaks down the food that you eat. When you, when you eat food, you're taking in the macronutrients, you're taking in protein, you're taking in fat, you're taking in carbohydrate. Your body will metabolize those. It'll obviously get rid of what it doesn't need, but it will store um, carbohydrate and fat for use at a later time. Your body's going to either use energy for the activity that you're participating in right away, or it's going to save it for use at a later date. That's why when you eat a piece of food, you need to think about it. Okay, if this food is you know 500 calories, for example, um, I'm taking in 500 calories of energy. Am I going to expend that energy or am I just going to store that energy? St energy stored in the body is stored as fat. That's basically what adip you know, um, adipose tissue or fat cells, lipids are uh, energy storage. So we, we get energy from fat and carbohydrate. Protein is used to rebuild and repair tissue. In certain cases, protein can be used for fuel, but pr not primarily doing regular exercise. It's only in extreme situations. For example, when the body runs out of glucose or carbohydrate, um, will the body start converting protein for fuel? Otherwise, protein is primarily used to repair tissue. Um, the fuel in your body, it comes from um, carbohydrate and comes from fat. So that's just a quick overview of the digestive system. Um, I'll be doing a couple other slides on this a little bit later in class, but just kind of want to talk about that because we need to talk about digestion. Digestion gives us the energy. We turn energy into muscle activity. So this kind of supports what I just said. You know, we look at that, we get food consumption. Sometimes I get ahead of the slides, but that's okay. Uh, we take food in, um, our body breaks it down. We need to use it or store it. And our fat is broken down to fatty acids. It's either stored in adipose tissue, um, which can be in the, in the abdominal cavity, can be other parts of the body, or it's um, fat uh, lipids. Um, lipids are fat cells. Uh, lipids are used, um, converted right away to generate ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. That is the um, actual chemical that our muscles convert. Um, they, they, they metabolize adenosine triphosphate to be able to burn uh, energy in order to be able to create muscle contractions. Um, when we look at carbohydrate, carbohydrate is either stored in muscles or stored in liver or it's being transported through the blood. Um, so our carbohydrate or glucose can be broken down into um, Carbohydrate is stored as glycogen. It can be stored in muscle and liver as glycogen, and it's transported through the bloodstream as glucose, and it's broken down into ATP. Protein is broken down into certain amino acids. Um, essential amino acids we need to get from our diet. Um, Non-essential amino acids our body can produce. So basically what we use amino acids for is growth and repair of tissue. We can generate ATP from amino acids in certain cases. It's called gluconeogenesis but that is only when we run out of available glucose. Um, you, if you've ever bonked, meaning you, you felt like you didn't have the energy to complete an exercise session or to complete a certain activity, then you have experienced a loss of glucose and your body has probably tapped into protein to be able to make that happen. So oxidative enzymes. Enzymes are um, structures in the body or chemicals in the body which, which facilitate or create certain reactions. So when we looked at regular resistance or cardiorespiratory training, what we're gonna do is we're gonna increase the size and number of mitochondria and skeletal muscle. Mitochondria are what uses oxygen. Mitochondria use oxygen to help create energy for the body. Mitochondria help use oxygen to create ATP in the body. Um, our enhanced muscle ability use oxygen and produce ATP. Oxidation is breaking down. When we oxidize something, we're breaking it down. So if we oxidize fat, we're oxidizing fat to be able to convert AT to, to produce ATP. If we oxidize glucose, we're doing it to convert ATP. So when we increase mitochondria, when we, inc when we do aerobic training, we do low, inten low intensity or steady state training, we're increasing mitochondrial density within the muscle tissue. When we increase mitochondrial density, we improve the oxidative capacity of the muscle. If all we're doing is anaerobic or high intensity interval training, Basically, what we're doing is we're training the muscle how to deplete stored, um, stored carbohydrate or stored ATP in the muscle, and we're not making the muscle more effective at using fat as a fuel. And we're going to go into a little bit more of that in a few, few minutes here. So cardiorespiratory system, um, we need oxygen. 
Uh, cardiorespiratory system is basically what, what brings the oxygen into the body. Right now, as you're breathing, your lungs, your respiratory system are pulling oxygen in from the air. Um, your air is not 100% oxygen. We have nitrogen in the air. There are other chemicals in the air. Um, but we basically have or other, I guess, oxygen is an element. Um, we have other elements in the air. And oxygen is what our body uses to help produce energy. So when we, we breathe, we're bringing oxygen in. We're, we're, we're taking it in. The, the, um, the alveoli in our lungs are pulling oxygen in, placing it into our blood. And our heart is pumping around the oxygenated blood to our working muscles. So that's basically what we're doing is we're trying to um, become more effective at delivering oxygen to the working muscles. Hemoglobin is a component of blood responsible for carrying oxygen. So um, that's one of the reasons why when, when people train, when athletes train to elevation, like when athletes train in the mountains or like, for example, the Olympic Training Center in Colorado, there's lower oxygen content in the air they're breathing. So what happens as a response, their body will produce more hemoglobin because there's less oxygen, they need more hemoglobin to carry the available oxygen to the working muscles. So that way, if they go from training in Colorado to competing in San Diego, competing at, at, um, at sea level, there's a lot more oxygen in the, in the air at sea level. Their body's gonna be much more efficient at carrying oxygen to the working, into the working muscles. So our cardiac system is, we see the heart there. The heart has four chambers. Blue is deoxygenated blood. Um, deoxygenated blood, if you look at your veins, um, your veins carry deoxygenated blood, so your veins have a bluish appearance because um, when blood doesn't have oxygen in it, it's darker, it's thicker. Um, when blood has oxygen in it, it's red. Um, anytime you get a cut, your blood automatically becomes red because it's receiving oxygen from the air. Uh, but sometimes within your body, well, sometimes, but deoxygenated blood within your body has a bluish tint. We look at um, we look at uh, how how body how blood moves to the heart. Deoxygenated blood comes into the atria are on top, the ventricles are on, on the bottom. The atria, the way I re, way you can remember that is your atrium A above V. Um, so your atria is on top, your ventricles on the bottom. Deoxygenated blood comes into the right atrium. Deoxygenated blood gets pushed from the right atrium into the right ventricle. Deoxygenated blood goes out. The right ventricle through the pulmonary artery. Um, artery is carrying carrying um, blood away from the body. Veins are carrying blood into the into the heart. Sorry, arteries are carrying blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood into the heart. So we get um, deoxygenated blood comes into the right atrium uh, via the superior, superior and inferior vena cava um, veins. It goes from the atrium to the right ventricle. Ventricle it goes out to the pulmonary arteries. From the ventricle, it goes to the, art, to the lungs where the lungs place oxygen into the blood. The oxygenated blood then comes back via um, the, the veins and we get, uh, the pulmonary, we get the pulmonary veins coming back in. We get the um, oxygenated blood coming into the left atrium and we get the oxygenated blood moving out to the body through the aorta artery. Um, artery is away, moving oxygenated blood away from the heart to the body. So you get Oxygenated blood comes into the left atrium and goes out through the left ventricle to the body. We measure um, cardiac output as a component of stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood pushed from the left ventricle. So every time your left ventricle contracts, it's pushing a certain amount of volume. When you train, when you do cardiorespiratory training, your, your heart becomes more effective at pushing, um, at pushing blood out with the left ventricle. That's one of the things we're doing when we train. We can't measure as a trainer, personal trainer, we don't have the ability to measure stroke volume, but understand that as clients become fitter, as you become fitter, your body is becoming more capable at pushing blood, um, oxygenated blood around the body. So you, you'll have a lower heart rate and you'll be able to move more blood with every contraction, kind of a cool thing. So O2 extraction, um, when the blood gets to your working muscles um, and the capillaries, um, the blood is diffused from the, um, the, the blood is diffused from your your uh, cardiorespiratory system into the muscles via the capillaries, and then the the oxygen in the blood will be used by the mitochondria to help produce energy. So slow twitch muscle fibers, um, slow twitch muscle fibers are aerobic muscle fibers because they have a much high, they have mitochondria. Fast twitch muscle fibers don't. Fast twitch muscle fibers use stored ATP or they produce ATP without oxygen in order to produce energy. Um, but when you have uh, slow twitch muscle fibers or type one muscle fibers, 
they use um, oxygen to help produce energy. So the circulatory system is moving oxygen to the muscle tissue where the type 1 muscle fibers will use the oxygen in the mitochondria to help produce ATP. Respiratory exchange ratio is um, the rate of the carbon dioxide produced relative to the amount of oxygen consumed. So when we look at respiratory exchange ratio, we want to watch, we measure the breathing. That's how we know how efficient, that's basically how we measure and we estimate, well, we measure a VO2 max. VO2 is a volume of oxygen consumption um, per kilogram of body weight. So we look at milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight, and that's how we can tell how efficient your body is at using oxygen. Now it's very important to remember that we, we burn about five calories of energy to consume one liter of oxygen. So the more efficient we are at using and consuming oxygen, then uh, we become more efficient at burning calories. So at rest, the, the average respiratory exchange ratio is about 0.75, meaning that you're burning about 85% and 15% carbohydrate. As exercise intensity increases, so is the respiratory, respiratory exchange ratio, meaning a larger percentage of carbohydrate is being burned and a lower percentage of fat. So as, you're, um, as you need energy quicker, it takes a little bit longer for your body to convert fat to ATP than carbohydrate. So we need energy quicker. What's going to happen is you're going to, you're, you're going to use less fat and more carbohydrate for fuel. Now here's the kicker. As you exercise at a higher intensity, you're breathing quicker. So when you breathe quicker, you're not able to talk as effectively. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's important in a second. So this uh, slide is talking about oxygen consumption. VO2, I just mentioned that. Again, I get ahead of myself sometimes. Uh, we look at milliliters of, of oxygen per kilogram of body weight. Um, that's basically how we measure the efficiency at which the body uses oxygen. So when we look at exercise, we want to help our clients consume more oxygen. The more oxygen they consume, the more efficient they are at burning calories. So um, when, when aerobic exercise begins, our body will release epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, generally called adrenaline because they're produced by adrenal gland. What it'll do is elevate our heart rate. Our heart rate will work quicker. Our heart rate will pump um, deoxygenated blood to the lungs quicker. The lungs will place oxygen into the bloodstream and pump it around um, back to the heart to be pumped out to the muscle tissue. So it takes a little while for our body to get up and firing and do that efficiently. So actually the first maybe six to 10 minutes you exercise, you're using primarily your anaerobic energy systems. So when you do cardiorespiratory exercise, the first six to 10 minutes is primarily anaerobic. That's why if you play sports, it's so important to do a proper warm up. So when you step on the field or when, when, when your sport starts, your heart rate, you're already warmed up and your body's gonna be much more efficient at using oxygen for fuel. That's where we get the uh, concept of EPOC. EPOC is excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. When you take a look at this slide, um, the oxygen deficit is that first six to 10 minutes of um, your body working anaerobically. It's using energy, it's using stored glycogen to create energy. It takes a little bit of time for your um, aerobic system to become more effective at bringing oxygen into the body, placing oxygen into the bloodstream, moving oxygen to the, to the muscle tissue where oxygen and fat are used for fuel, especially at lower intensity exercises. Now, the higher intensity exercise that you do, the more your body will need oxygen after exercise. So XX post, post exercise oxygen consumption is what EPOC is. So after you're done exercising, think of EPOC as your body staying warm longer. If you're a fan of Seinfeld, if you remember the episode where George goes to work and he, he's claiming he's still sweating because the shower didn't take, that's an example of EPOC because it takes, if you the higher int the, the intensity of the exercise, the longer the EPOC. Just like if you drive your car a long way, you don't shut your car off and it cools automatically. The, the, the longer you drive your car, the faster you drive your car, the longer it takes to cool down. So the more intense, the higher intensity your exercise, the longer your EPOC effect after exercise. But here's the kicker. EPOC can maybe, at the most, maybe add another 150 to 175 um, calories to exercise. So it's not, it doesn't mean you get done with exercise and go, whoo, I had a really high intensity exercise. Let me go grab a 500 calorie muffin or a 500 calorie coffee drink because you will weigh, you'll, you'll just take in as many calories as you just expended or an exercise. So EPOC is a real thing, but it doesn't have that significant of an impact on um, calorie burning. Anaerobic threshold is when the body can no longer use oxygen efficiently. Um, what happens at the anaerobic threshold 
is your body is not able to efficiently use oxygen. There's a buildup of lactate. Um, there's a buildup of CO2. That's why your breathing gets much quicker. Um, and it's what we call the second ventilatory threshold. So VT2 is an indicator of anaerobic threshold. And we'll define what VT1 here is a second. The first ventilatory threshold is as exercise intensity increases, your breathing rate increases. The first ventilatory threshold, VT1, is when your body is actually using more um, carbohydrate than oxygen, or sorry, first ventilatory threshold is when your body needs energy quicker and your body's gonna be consuming more carbohydrate than fat. Up until VT1, your body's gonna be metabolizing primarily fat to produce ATP. At VT1 and above, you're, you're working much harder, so you're not gonna use fat for fuel. You're gonna use glycogen or stored carbohydrate. Above VT2, your body is going to use primarily stored ATP or, or stored uh, creatine monophosphate, and your body will run out of that relatively quickly. Below VT1, you can exercise for an extended period of time until you get bored. Between VT1 and VT2, the limiting factor is um, an accumulation of blood lactate or accumulation of acidosis. It's also hydrogen ions. Above VT2, your limiting factor is you're going to deplete ATP and you have no more ATP left, so you need to recover. Um, when you look at aerobic training or card typical cardio training, if you're training aerobically, you're training at or below VT1. As soon as you start working above the first ventilatory threshold, you're going to be working anaerobically, meaning your body's producing ATP without oxygen. Aerobic just means you're producing ATP with oxygen. Working, you know, When you work anaerobically, you're producing ATP without oxygen. Above VT2, you have a very limited supply and will deplete that rather quickly. So said principle, um, your body will adapt to how you use it. If you want to become more effective for aerobic exercise, guess what? You need to do aerobic vent you need to do aerobic training at or below the first ventilatory threshold. If you do constantly do high intensity anaerobic or if you're constantly doing high intensity interval training, you're working anaerobically. That can elevate your, your uh, VO2, your ability to use oxygen, but you don't in enhance your mitochondrial density as efficiently. You know, HIIT training can help burn a few more calories, but in reality, there's actually been some research to show that you can burn about the same amount of calories doing HIIT training and doing aerobic training. Aerobic training is a lot less stressful on the body. High intensity interval training produces a lot of um, acidosis and produces a lot of damage to your muscle and to your tissue as well. So when we understand how to use um, VT1 and VT2, we can identify VT1 with the talk test. I'm gonna throw up a um, I'm gonna throw up a YouTube clip of how to do the talk test. If we um, identify VT1, then if we work if we identify the heart rate at VT1, if we work at that heart rate or below, we're working aerobically. Say we identify um, heart rate at VT1 is 140 beats a minute, or sorry, yeah, 140 beats a minute. That means that about 140 beats a minute, you're working primarily aerobically. So you want to stay at or just below um, 140 beats a minute to be as aerobically efficient as possible. Because once you start going over 140 beats a minute, you'll be in zone two, or if you go way over that, you'll be in zone three. And what you're gonna do is deplete the available energy. When you're working anaerobically, you're gonna deplete the carbohydrate and de deplete the, the ATP. And that means at some point you're gonna to have to rest to allow um, the body to replenish. That's why high intensity intervals, that's what intervals are for. When you work at a high intensity, you need a recovery interval. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, it's not an appropriate recovery interval. You need a recovery interval, usually about two to one or three to one. So if you work at high intensity for 30 seconds, you need anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds to have an appropriate um, recovery to allow your body to catch up. Remove um, CO2 from the lungs, remove, um, remove acidosis, or remove hydrogen ions from the muscle tissue so you continue to work. And there we go. Um, that's just a little overview of our um, of our uh, digestive and metabolic systems. We'll be doing a few more examples specifically in class.